Welcome to Look, Listen, Laugh. This week, I sit down with an award-winning comedian, writer, TV personality, radio presenter. I love watching this guy work on stage, and whenever I run into him off stage, it's always a, a joyous experience. So here's my chat with Lawrence Mooney. That's very... Uh... Was that to get my attention? <laughs> 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 Our very primary school teacher. Yeah. Lawrence, <laughs> up here, please. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, well, th we've begun the podcast. Lawrence is looking at his phone. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, over this very, so, Already out of the gates. He's like, i gotta, I got to start scrolling. No, I was just happening. talking about tea. Yes. And um, I looked it up recently because I was in England about when it was first introduced to England because it's the great English tea. It, yeah. It essentially, you know, helped the English colonise the world. And it was the 1600s, but it was a novelty back then. Coffee was massive mm. already in England. And uh, so, yeah, it's some nobility got it as a birthday present from the Dutch traders. From India? Is that where it originated? China. China? China. Oh, yeah, that makes sense then. China was the tea first. Yes. I reckon the English might have taken tea to India. Good point. Good point. And it's like, we can grow our own because we've got this huge tropical continent. Yes. Yeah. You would see people, when I was in China years ago, uh, like on the train traveling 14 hours across country, and you'd see everyone would have their little, little jar of tea. Right. Yeah. It was like a... But it was the green tea, it wasn't the, you know, the Earl Grey as we know. Or, or the, the English, English breakfast. breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it started being drunk at, at, um, at nobility parties, you know, the, the gentry mm. were drinking it. And so it was like something for us. It wasn't for the common For the man. commoners. No. Yeah. But then they, they spread it amongst the commoners. Mm. Well, and it, it's, and it's good... taken off. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's yeah. all about that. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then the biscuits that go along with it. I was reading um, Billy Connolly's autobiography and he was talking about uh, he just loves an afternoon tea and biscuit. Yeah. And dunk, dunk it in. You know, he said, there's nothing better. There is nothing better. Yeah. I, I've become a real tea man over day drinking. It helps me just not drink alcohol. Sure. sure. And it's so much better. Of course. It's so much better <laughs> in every in possible way. In every possible way. way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I got some smack here, Lawrence. Now I'll go with the, the English I'll, breakfast. Thanks. And do you know what? The Dunking Biscuit is a big choice. Yes. So my Dunking Biscuit of choice, the Monte Carlo. Oh, I had... You know, it's I, a I, strong biscuit. It is. It's got a good creamy, creamy jam yeah, filled creamy center. center. Yeah, creamy center. The Monte Carlo, and it's a good size too. You feel like you're having, yeah. you know, if you have something like a Kingston, it's too small. It's it's, like, the Kingston it's, is a sugary little interloper. <laughs> it came very light to the assorted creams. Yeah. No, and I King judge people harshly on their, if yeah. they have a packet of Kingston, it's just sitting there, it's like, mm, mm, no. we'll be winding this up pretty quickly. <laughs> the, but you're right, the Monte Carlo, that, that is the Rolls Royce of uh, Arnott's biscuits. And biscuits in general. I bought the um, creams. The, uh, I had them the last assorted night. creams. I had them last night. I, I, uh, I just had one of those cravings. I never normally do that, but you know, you, you know when you go back to your childhood at times, and you're yes. like, that's what I used to eat when I was a kid. And I just bought a big s slab of it and put them into a, into a bowl and sat up watching a movie. Right. Eating. Yeah. So I, I do a bit on assorted creams. I'm a Monte Carlo man. You can yes. tell by the way I carry myself. Of course. Goes um, without saying. I will have you know, a Delta cream at a pinch. It's a mm. chocolatey biscuit, it's a child's biscuit, mm -hmm. maybe even a shortbread cream, but orange slices. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> With your poisonous citrusy flavour that nah. infects the rest of the packet. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. No. Nah. And inevitably, whenever I did that, there'd be someone go, oh, you know, like, who likes orange slices? Right. I said, well, you can have them all to yourself. They're always the last in the biscuit barrel or the biscuit tin. They're at the bottom, they're chipped. But you know what I do? I eat them first. When I get that, last night I had the orange. Like an two, entree. Two I had it first because I'm kind of hungry. And so if I have it after the Monte, you can't follow the Monte Carlo with an orange, right? It's very good. So, so open, you knock the edge off. Yes. 
Right. Yeah, so then when I can really savour the Monte Carlo when I have it instead of scoffing it down, you know, so... And, and I always... I, so it's I, I got like, its place. The what? It's got its place. Yeah, it does. It does. Slice. Yeah. I like delay gratification. You know, when I know that something's good's going to happen, right, okay. I, I hold back and like, oh, that's going to, you know, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. That's not who I am. <laughs> <laughs> We're like yin right. and yang. That's why, that's why we work. That's why, you know, we... we we've we've toured very, very... Um, I don't want to use the word comfortably, but in sync together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in sync. Mm. We are yin and yang. Because I've had two shopping experiences with you. One, we were on a cruise back in 2010. Yes. And we were, I don't know what the destination was, but we stopped and we could shop duty free. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to get some sunglasses. And I was I trying remember. some on and then I was trying another pair on. I had a pair of aviators and a pair of um, oh, Ray-Ban with kind of like a like a movie director's, an Italian movie director's glasses, a bit of a horn rim. Were they like a Wayfarer kind of? Yeah, yeah. but they, were a, yeah. they weren't a Wayfarer. But, but they, of that ilk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't know, I want them both. And you said, get them both, buy them both. And I went, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> You're the best. And so I bought them both and I was so happy. The next time, um, we were in JB Hi-Fi together. It was a Melbourne Comedy Festival downstairs and they were having a sale. And I said, oh, I've got too many DVDs, but look at that boxed Seinfeld collection. Mm. It looks great. You said, get it. Yeah. Why wouldn't you get it? You work hard for your money. It's like, Joel, <laughs> you're my girlfriend. <laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember that first instance, you with the sunglasses. Yeah. And there were people coming in trying to get the sunglasses. And be like, no, no, come on, he's doing his thing. And it was kind of like a pretty woman kind of thing. You'd turn around like that, and I'm like... <laughs> and then they're, they're the ones. <laughs> and anyways, I've got still got those. I'm a keeper. I look after things. Yes. My father always said, you know, look after something. It'll last you for the rest of your life. Yep. Never a true word spoken. And I, if it's quality, you better yeah. buy, spending a little bit extra getting quality. Because if, you, if it's just some junk thing that you're going to buy. If it's you, a rip off. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and plus you're not then encouraged to look after it. No. Because no, you didn't no pay respect. the price. No. Yeah. yeah. There's an investment. When so, you, when yeah, the Ray-Bans, you know, the, the aviators, they'll get cleaned and then they've had a new life. I love it. With Biden. Oh, yeah, they're back. <laughs> like, <laughs> my man. Yes. <laughs> that fashion plate. <laughs> Joe. Yeah. You look good in your... Oh, and he's hit the steps. <laughs> <laughs> he's down. Are the glasses on? The glasses oh, the glasses are okay. Yeah, they're good. Oh, God. Yeah. I, I, it would break my heart. Well, seeing trip or stumble breaks my heart anyway. Mm. And, you know, uh, Trump going, it's elder abuse. Look at him. Look how old he is. It's elder abuse is like, you're calling that guy <laughs> yeah. old. That means Hello. everyone's old. <laughs> yeah. But if he cracked his, his aviators, that would really the, the, upset me. That would, be, that would be the end of the administration, I think. Yeah, I think... The, the, you know, are they a Ray Ban too? The aviators, yeah, they yeah, would. Yeah, Ray Ban sure. would say, the endorsements over. The endorsements <laughs> over. We send them back, Joe. <laughs> Come on, Joe. Come on. Send all the aviators back. You can go on to something else. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know what kind of glasses you're going to wear next. Oakleys or yeah. no, those, wrap those, those wrap around. You know, <laughs> like, like they go over the bifocals. Oh, you know? and they've got the side panel. Yes, the side you see. Yeah. Yeah. The oh. Oh, men driving along with them. And the, and, yeah. They've and stopped the, using their necks, haven't yeah, they? they just, yeah. yeah, yeah, off to the side. I feel, yeah, neck rotation is something that really does start to go. You've got to look after your neck rotation. Well, I did, I did a, uh, I made a short film during the lockdown about the challenges and struggles of the COVID lockdown, but through the eyes of Batman, right? And I, right. And I, got, and I, I found the original 89 cow being that this guy makes from the original Michael Keaton mold. And I so say Michael Keaton. Yeah, so put put it on but that whole turning like that, it's like the Michael Keaton turn. And so something happens over there, whoosh, over there you know, so it's uh, oh, right. and yeah. is that gone now that the Michael Keaton turn? Yeah, yeah, oh. the, the, there's the head yeah, every, everyone's got mobility in the head. That was in the Christopher Nolan, I think Dark Knight, um the Dark Knight. He he, he had mobility in it. But I like that whole turn. Yeah. yeah. I, 
And it means action too. Yeah, yeah. Like if you're walking, yeah, yeah. If if Batman turns towards you like that, you know shit's going down. That when that first one came out, nineteen eighty nine, yes, and it had Jack Nicholson in it, who is my absolute hero. Mm. Mm. Um, and I know hero is a big word, and it's like, why is he your hero? Shut up, he's my hero. No, Jack. I is, stare at his pictures. He's an I, icon. He's an icon, and um, it came out, went along, and. I think it was the first time in my movie going experience, maybe in Australian cinemas, where they had combos. Mm. And I went along with a girlfriend at the time. And it's like, get a coat, get a. Do you want a combo? It's like, you get uh, the. Popcorn? Well, no, the, the cup with oh, Batman on it. Yes. And it's like, oh my God, yeah, I want a combo. I want that big cup. Mm. And Michael Keaton's on one side, and then Batman's on the other, and Jack's on one side as well. Right. Now, M- Michelle Pfeiffer wasn't in that movie. No, or... she was in She was in Returns, the sequel. Right. It was Kim Bassinger in the 89. Right. I think they were all on that cup. And so that cup faded gracefully on my bedroom shelf for many, many years. That. Until I was, I think, you know, I was in a share house somewhere, and we were moving out, the cup. Had, to had go. it met its demise? I, th- I think it had, yeah. I think That'd be worth handled... something nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> All that 89 memorabilia. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Could you Have you ever sold anything memorabilia wise on, no. on eBay? Because everyone goes, that could, that'd be worth N- something. No, no, I, I, I'm, I tend to hold on to all that kind right. of stuff. Yeah, I, and, although I had, because when I left school, I moved to America and I had a lot of stuff at my mum's place and I had this coin collection that my grandfather passed down to me and it was these really rare pennies and, and, I, and I would look at it and clean it and, you know, I was, I was very um, obsessed with it when I was younger. And then I started, I would save up, I'd have a paper run, I'd save up money and go and visit my grandmother down in Queanbeyan, go to the Australian Mint, buy the mint pressed, you know, coins. And they're in the in little Canberra. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was like, yeah, I was really. Um, you were a coin guy. I was a coin guy. I'd go into the, the, the into the city. There was a coin shop in there. Show them my coins and get them appraised and take them home. And so I was very, uh, you know, very much into this. And when I got back from the states, Mum had moved. And I go, so where's the coin collection? She's like, the what? Gone. Not what? Thrown away? Not even cashed in? I don't in. know. She doesn't even know where it went. Have you? Have you? Let I looked at. Everywhere for those. Do you coins. still go past a coin shop and go? I just oh, keep. I keep on. I don't even yeah, look. Yeah. I keep on walking. It's too confronting, you know, to go back to, you know, this this prize collection of my childhood gone, and there were other stuff that was gone. Like I would. I would. Throwing so someone's keep... collection away is a hard thing to do, though. Yeah, but I don't think she threw it. Uh, like, you know, she got no, remarried even... and they moved, and then oh, she was crazy and, in love. Yeah, and then, who knows? I, you know, and then she got divorced. So then, and then I went. You, I, and I you, went back to the you, place. Did your stepfather like you? Um, we got along fine. Maybe but, he's but I like, wasn't, oh, yeah. <laughs> here's Joel's coin collection. <laughs> <laughs> I could retire. I'm gonna get rid. Of, I'm gonna sell it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, maybe and I, you cashed I, it in. Perhaps. Yeah. I. I and I, I used to keep ticket stubs from concerts. I would oh, go so to I, programs. I had, you know. I had tins of ticket stubs, yeah. and you know all that stuff. And dreamt one day of the big vision board of my yes. th- theatre going and concert yes. going history. Yes. And then I've still got the tin somewhere. You do? I still that got w- the You tin. should do that. That would be like, because I, I had that internal. Uh, if dream. I put that on a wall, people would come and go, what's that? And I'd say, that's all the concerts and theatre shows I've been to. And they'd think, why is that on a. No, no, a I, wall? I would go, that is fantastic. And I would, I would study it all. I'd look at the dates mm. where you were sitting. But you. I'm, we are we have matched. Yeah. We're the perfect match. <laughs> Bring back the wall. Oh, my God, it's Joel. I knew it would be. <laughs> it's true. We've been dating. We went on a, we went on a once-in-a-lifetime cruise we together. We did. Uh, you know what I loved about that? The fact that we never went to the buffet. You and I would go to the fine dining every night yeah, for I, dinner. I, 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 I think I'd set the tone there. I said, Joel, I, I like to dine mm. and drink some wine. You, you said, yeah, let's do it. And we'd spend and, hours in there. And that, that was a cost. You had to pay, and mm-hmm. as I think you're an honorary officer, and so you get an extra discount as a, as a performer. You're an honorary officer, right? And martinis for like four <laughs> bucks. 
So I'd be pie-eyed. <laughs> I'd be sipping the tea, like you'd be on the martini. Lawrence, I think it's time we went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Chaperone you back to the cabin. But you know what I loved about that? When we both got on, they had given us crew cabins and you're like, this isn't on. And you went up to them and said, look, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're two entertainers. We, 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 need, we need a room with a, you know, a passenger room with a, with a window. I'd, I've never had that on, like that happen right. on, on on that cruise line that we're on in particular. Carnival. And, yeah, carnival. Mm. And yeah, we, we you we, and I, we, we were we just calling the shots. Yeah. yeah, it was beautiful. And they were great. They were really good. I don't do cruises anymore. No, I My career doing... came to an end on the Royal Caribbean cruise line. Oh, what happened? On where that? they 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 said they'd had an unprecedented volume of complaints. <laughs> I think it was what the, happened? I think it was the um, the family show. Ah. I went down and I just, you know, thought I'll... I, in fact, I said, this is the uh, let's see what we can get over their heads show. Yeah, nice. And it's just doing a lot of double entendre. And then I asked this kid, and, and no, kids were loving it and laughing it up. And, you know, they know that if, if people are laughing around them, they're laughing, they don't know what they're laughing yeah, at. Yeah, they're into it, yeah. And I said to this kid... Have your parents woken you up in the middle of the night by making noises? <laughs> he said, yeah. Last night they were making a lot of noises. I said, and the parents were like, ooh. Everyone you, else. You feel this murmur. Oh, oh, oh yeah, you know, all the, the other murmur. parents. Don't yeah. start talking to the kid about his parents having sex. Yeah. I said, because, you know, you're trying to be as quiet as possible, aren't you? You know, someone's biting on a towel. Someone's <laughs> biting on the curtains. And there was general laughter, but then there was complaints. Yeah. But that's the way to go, though, on one of those cruises. If you like, like parents have got to enjoy it too at the family show. Yeah, they do. Is that fun? But you and I did um, kids shows on, on that carnival. Remember, yeah. we had to do like the early kids show, and then we did the late night show. But a bit of Q and A is good for the kids. You do it, a bit of Q and A. It is. You? Hey, let's get the kids up. Hey, you got yeah. a joke? Hey, you yeah, know. Yeah. All right, there's twenty minutes. Have you got a joke? All right, I'm going to tell my favourite kids joke. Of course, yeah. why do dogs have cold noses? So they don't burn other dogs' bums. And the kids are like, you said bums. <laughs> Killing. I said, all right, you can use a rude word, but only poo or bum. It's like, ah, poo or bum. And there's a whole industry, you know, the day my bum went yeah, psycho. Yeah, yeah. All those, my underpants were yeah, set on <laughs> yeah, fire yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's yeah, undies yeah. and snot. Yeah, yeah. Snot and grot. Toilets yeah, yeah. and stuff. And farts are hilarious. Oh, yeah. I actually did a uh, kids show in Melbourne. And I got these kids up and I said, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to imitate our mum's farts. And the kids are loving it. This, there was a reviewer there who was, farts aren't funny. It's like, oh, I beg to differ. Mm, I think, um, yeah, it, I, I was buried. My, my children's career hasn't gone well. <laughs> Well, you, the, the, those kids shows though are, um, can be interesting. I, I once did one out at the uh, Collingwood Petting Farm, and yeah, it was the, yeah it, the children's farm. Yeah, the children's farm. Yeah, yeah, down by the Yarra. It's lovely. It is beautiful, and it was out there. It was outdoors. There was um, bales of hay. Yep. And I was doing it with um, real country feel, right in the middle of Collingwood. Yeah, yeah. It was it was, it was real. It was really fun. You know, it was daytime, and you know, grandparents. Little kids, parents, the whole family, and I'm. I think I think it was Claire Hooper was MC. I was middling, and Dave Williams was closing. Dave's very good at da that. Dave, Dave da is good at that. Dave and MC'd the one that I did the, okay. the fart competition. Okay, and he he killed. Yeah. So we, we go on. Um, do do the do the spot up front. It's outdoors. Bales of hay. Blah blah blah. Goes well. Afterwards, the organizer came up and said, "Look, we're going to flip it." Joel, you close the next one. Dave's going to middle for that one. Claire, you open. I went, uh, Dave, you're all right with that? I, I'm fine with it. He goes, yeah, sure. All right. I go, <laughs> I go up. Just, just before I go up, the guy says to me, listen, the, you know, the clouds are coming over. We're going to see how it goes. If we have to, we're going to move it back to the barn. But look, we're going to start the show anyway here outdoors. But if that happens, just a heads up. Claire goes back up to bring, um, to bring Dave on. And the guy's like, this doesn't look good. Like, it's coming over. But Dave's on the other side. I'm like, well, you've got to let Dave know, you know, what's going on. He's got no idea. The clouds are coming over. Please welcome, you know, Dave Williams. 
the heavens open, the rain, everyone's, ah! Dave's just got to the mic. The tech guys run up, grab the mic away from Dave, run back to the barn, they're moving all the equipment, and then everyone, back to the barn, back to the barn. So Dave's like, oh, what? And everyone's moved back to the barn. Everyone gets settled. They're, all right, Dave's coming back up now. Dave goes up to the mic. Before he even gets a word, this little kid stands up at the top of his voice, points and yells, that's the man that fucked me last night. Silence. And I hear an old lady goes, what did he say? And Dave's standing there like, oh, I, I, uh, a, a little kid yelled that out. Yes. In front of grandparents, the family at the Collingwood Children's Zoo. Dave is standing there. I, I, what? All right. How do you deal with that? I'm, I'm standing going, oh my God, like, this could have been me, you know. I'm standing there watching this like, oh my God, what, like, what is he going to say? And he goes, oh, you might be Billy Jean, but I, I'm not your father. And everyone goes, mm, no, 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 no. That's not working. No. And it was is that like, the lyrics? I don't even uh, know. I'm not your lover. <laughs> I'm not your lover or whatever. That's right. That's yeah. what I said. I'm not your lover. Um, and it's struggle street from there. You know, how do you recover from that, right? How old is this kid? I don't know, 11. Right. So he's yeah. done, done it as a prank or were there allegations? <laughs> <laughs> what if the kid this was where, telling the this truth? This is where it all came out. Yeah, so, and then uh, understandably, Dave was shaken. What do you do? Like, you know, it's a, it's a hard gig to follow. Well, everyone's it, shaken. It's so discombobulating for a child to even out of that sentence. Right. And I, I get back to the, we're driving back and here's, the, like, yeah. Is and, this organised by the comedy festival? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so we, I get back, I think I told Jamoan and a couple of people and it spread like wildfire across the, uh, yeah, throughout, the <laughs> throughout the festival. The next day it's a big thing at the town hall and we're doing this children's stand-up performance for the Nickelodeon channel. And we're all sitting around talking about it. So did you, did Dave headline that one or did you go so, on after Dave? No, no, I, as I was just saying, that, I, I, I went on after Dave, on that one, yeah. A, and how were you when after the, that's the guy that... Uh, it was all right. I, I, you know, I went into street mode and I didn't talk about it. I thought I'm not even going anywhere now. I'm no, given no. a wide berth yeah, from yeah. this and just pretended like nothing happened and it was fine. Street mode. Yeah. <laughs> it was... Explain street mode. Well, we, 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 I start off doing street performing, yeah, right? Yeah, so, right. So it's like, you were, so it's, it goes, goes beyond the performance on working the crowd and gathering them in and getting them in the yeah. right mindset and everything. So I went out there just with a very, you know, big kind of performance kind of um, attitude with the whole thing to so kind of try and so overcompensate a lot about attitude and interaction rather than comedy per se right well initially and but yeah, yeah. see i was always see this is the thing with street performers they would do a 45 minute show and 30 probably like yeah 35 minutes of that was crowd work and crowd drawing and yeah. 10 minutes of actually performance i was the other way around i like to do like a five minute the quickest crowd draw i could do and then do like a 20 minute performance to try and you know get good at what i was get the flight hours and down keep the material. Them. yeah and, and keep get the dollars them. right so, so yeah, my whole thing is about, you know, getting the audience uh, centred, focused, damn, Bang. we're off, you know. So Are we I'd, keeping so, an eye on the kid? Yeah, that... yeah, yeah. I think one of the parents came over and spoke to the kid like, after that allegation happened. But that next day, we're, for the big nickel, and we're all backstage at the Melbourne It's a town. fair heckle in terms of heckling. It's got to be the worst heckle I've ever heard, right? And the best. It's yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> Hey, that's the guy that fucked me last night. It's a great heckle. Imagine going to see Seinfeld at the International Convention Centre and just go, hey, that's the guy that fucked me last night. And see Seinfeld deal with that. Like, yeah. <laughs> Who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> What's he going to do with that? Yeah, what do you do? Especially coming from a child, what do you do with it, right? Yeah, I suppose like, from an adult. Adult is like, oh, all right, in this yeah, yeah. day and age, whatever. But... From a child, there's no, like, there's no coming. And the fact that, like, Dave tried to do, like, a Michael Jackson kind of reference and a, ooh, no, 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 no. from the audience. But, but MJ, the, everyone's, everyone's gone right off him, haven't they? Well, you know that they're making a biopic. Um, Jaffa Jackson, I think that's how you pronounce his name, Jermaine's son, is playing Michael Jackson in the Michael Jackson biopic. 
He looks just like him. He sounds just like him. And my thought is, I hope he doesn't go full method with this role. Yeah. You know, that's not going to be a Yeah, you wouldn't you want know. him to set his head on fire. <laughs> 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 yeah. That, I think that would be the least of the, the, the worries about going method. Yeah, the that, method, yeah. yeah. The, well, but, as um, so, Jimmy Carr says, R. I. Michael Jackson, R.I. Pedo. <laughs> yeah, he's um, yeah. It'd be interesting to see how they deal with that in the biopic. I, I would, I would watch that. Yeah, I, it's a fascinating story, but really, you know, so young. And what's the what was the the drug of choice? Fentanyl. No, yeah, yeah, it was an, an, no, an, no, it was like a liquid drug. form. Yeah, it was because fentanyl's got a lot of like Tom Petty, Prince. You know, uh, Tom went out with the fentanyl, almost a choice well, or a misadventure. I think a misadventure. Same okay. with Prince. He thought he was taking, um, um, what's the, Oxycontin. Yeah, right. It, it's bad. But the fentanyl... I, did Prince have a pain management issue? Was he taking... He, he, he was taking, uh, he, he had a lot of um, prescriptions for it. Right. But he ran out of, he used it all up, he couldn't get it, so he bought it off the black market, which he thought was... Um, was, um, Black oxy. market's a pretty racist term. It is. Yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, the the yeah. subsidiary market, the <laughs> underground market, the yeah. online market, yeah. the deep web. The, yeah. the black suggests <laughs> the that dark. Black is illegal or evil yeah. or... Mm, the dark market. We'll no? be cutting Cut. black out of that, that's for sure. <laughs> I think everyone knows what you mean by the black market. <laughs> But it is, uh, it's bad in the States that, 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 that Oxycontin, is... Oxycontin, the... N now fentanyl. fentanyl. The oxy was, but the, the, the amount, of, especially in San Francisco, I was there last year, and you can clearly see the effect of it on the streets, like people crouched, doing that crouch over, just s sort of standing there, but bent over. You I was see in them. San Francisco last year, and we you stayed saw... right next to Tenderloin. You know, oh. San Francisco is like seven districts. Yes or whatever it is. And Tenderloin used to be this kind of, you know, bohemian, arty district for people that don't know San Francisco. No. And where you would go for drugs, but now it's just two big hills and cross streets of tents mm -hmm. and homeless and people shuffling mm -hmm. either on ice or addicted to, you know, um, uh, opiates, mm -hmm. opioids. Yeah. Uh, and... Kind of, you, you don't feel, I, I thought I'm going to walk through, because we were right on the edge of it. Um, I'm going to walk through and have a look. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty benign. Mm. The nature of the addiction and mm -hmm. the, the way that these people are wasted. They, you know, there's a lot of that junky touching the face or combing the hair. And then at night, and Maggie, who is my 10-year-old, she said, I, I don't like around here. I said, these people are our people mm -hmm. and bad things have happened in their life and you've got to remember that they're, they're not dangerous people, they're just desperate people. Mm -hmm. So at night, all these people had come out of Tenderloin onto this kind of triangular area and create a little flea market of the stuff that they'd been pinching that day. Right. And so I said, we're going to go down and we're going to... Get a new pair of Ray-Bans. Yeah, we're going to get some Band-Aids and some shaving cream. You know, <laughs> shit that's been stolen from shops and supermarkets. Sure, sure. And, um, and I wanted her to see that these people are pretty... But I, I know yeah. you're taking a risk. So we went down and we walked amongst them. And there's still, you know, uh, even regardless of how off your head you are, there's consciousness that there's a child there and there's a bit of straightening up and there's a bit of, like, just, yeah, you know, accommodating sure. the child, you know, get, getting out of the way. Mm. And um, and I'm sure it kicks off in that little flea market. And there's some people out down there who are just, you know, dragging their own skin and there was a guy setting fire to his pants and then putting it out. Yeah. It's like, what's he doing? And then there's a guy, you know, taking a dump and there's a bit of... Anti-social behaviour, but I think it's kind of essential for kids to see that stuff. Sure, sure. So they're like, the, rather than the others, it's like, this could they're happen people. to anyone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is really sad to see, and the, the extent of it too. And in San Francisco, they have the highest fatality rate from, from fentanyl in America. So is, when you get 
a broken bone and the ambulance turns up and they give you the green stick. Mm. Is that fentanyl or is that something else? I don't know. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, but they do they, administer. They, they definitely do it. administer fentanyl in, in hospitals. Sure. Yeah, ambulance officers um, had been detected taking the drug. Uh, you know, signing off and um, not administering it to people in pain. Right. Which I guess is you know, you know, there's addicts in every walk of life, and you're going to find them in the medical industry. Yeah. Or, you know, frontline attendees. Sure, sure. And there's a good reason for getting drug addicted if you're seeing you know, what you're, car what accidents or, right. you know, people maimed and opened up every day. Yeah, it's got to be a hard, uh, yeah, it's, it's got to be a hard Just job. Just imagine that. The what? Just imagine that. Like the radio goes, there's the address. Like, what are we going to find? Mm -hmm. We're going to find someone distraught standing over somebody else mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of trauma to deal with that's why i always feel like you know i know police officers get a lot of flack but that's a hard job you know having to deal with you know with the psychological effects of, of and what you bring home to your wife or significant yeah. other uh husband and, and it's, not seeing a lot of really positive outcomes. You're seeing trauma from right. victims and yes. perpetrators and right. drug addiction right. and death. Right. But the, I think the worst thing would be knocking on someone's door. Mm. Mm. They open the door and they see cops there. It's like, <sighs> yeah. can we come inside? Yeah, just being exposed to that. Yeah, I've got a friend who's uh, a, fr a school friend who's a cop and yeah, he's um, he's a good guy, but yeah, we you know he's I, a good guy. He's a good guy. I, I worked with his dad. Hell yeah. of a fine cop. <laughs> <laughs> a real detective, you know, one, one of the good guys. I worked with your old man Osborne. <laughs> he was one of the good guys. <laughs> sure, he didn't always do it by the book, but, but hey, anyway, give me your badge and your gun. You're <laughs> off the case. You're in too deep, Osborne. <laughs> I'd love to do it. <laughs> a, a, a cop film like yeah. Flying High, but using all the cop all, tropes, all the, all the cliches. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're in too deep. You don't know. Did you ever see a film in the '80s called No Man's Land, with Charlie no. Sheen and DB Sweeney, and the, and and um, Randy Quaid, and Randy. I Quaid, love Randy Quaid. Randy's that cop. You're in too deep. You don't know the difference. You know, and he's like DB Sweeney's. Uh, Charlie Sheen's like heading up this organization stealing 911 Porsches, and DB Sweeney's like this whiz mechanic that ends up okay. going undercover. He's an undercover cop as well. DB Sweeney's. I, I'm not bringing a face to the name. Can um, you give me some other credits? Uh, yeah, he was in um, Lonesome Dove with Robert Duvall. Um, okay. Yeah, he's he's like one of those '80s guys. But he, I'll show you a picture afterwards. You see him go, that guy. Ah, DB yeah. Sweeney. Yeah, 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 and. Yeah, and that was, he was the young rookie cop, and uh, Randy Quaid was the it was the. You're in too deep. You gotta get out. You know. You're taking it personal. Yeah, and he wears like the trench coat. Meets up with him in a rainy day underneath. One of my favorite movies from that era, and another cop movie was Dennis Quaid in The Big Easy. Oh yeah, and yeah, he plays sure. a um, New Orleans cop, mm -hmm. New Orleans, and they're yeah, all doing New these. Orleans down south accents. Mm -hmm. What Mom. you have to understand is that <laughs> this man is a fine upstanding member of the community. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was this like defence lawyer because it's all about police corruption. Sure. But corrupt cops who are good. Mm. That yes, kind of like, yeah. And Ellen Barkin was in it and mm -hmm. she became the, right. the siren of the era. She mm. was so sexy and smoky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she, she was, um, yeah, she, she, that was a... That, and still is. Yeah. I, shouldn't, I shouldn't put a past tense on that. Sea of Love? Ellen, sea of Love, yeah. Ellen Barkin, right? Yeah, she was great in that. Yeah. The, my, my wife's from Louisiana, so I've spent a lot of time... Are you a fine upstanding member of the community? <laughs> <laughs> but even the way that they, the, uh, you, you know, like there was this um, guy up against the wall, this black guy leaning up against the wall, and... You know, if it was in Australia, it'd be like, well, what are you talking about, dude? But with that, it's we, we, just their little, like, pick-up lines, and he sees my wife walking by, and he's like, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and that, that, was, that, that was the initial part. And then he goes, 
there goes a fine, tall glass of water. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, that's like the best. Yeah, Man, tall like, glass of water is good. Yeah, yeah, it's like... That could have been... Please. That could have been a whole lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. Fine, tall glass of water, which is refreshing. Yeah, mm. it's beautiful. It's like, what, what a great come on line. Um, in fact, I've got a lot of favourite films or a number that are set in the South. Yeah. Because um, Paul Newman and... Um, Liz Taylor in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Great film. And that Great. is all about... Tennessee Williams, brilliant. Sometimes, Britt, I just, I just <laughs> so confused. I, I feel like a, a cat on a hot yeah. tin roof. Well, why don't you jump, Maggie? Jump. Cats always land on their feet, don't they? <laughs> That's great. Ooh, Those yeah. no-neck monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and Big Daddy. You know, she, mm, she thought big she, daddy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big controlling man. Yeah. Mm, threatening. And um, Cool Hand Luke, which also had Paul Newman in it. Yeah. Paul, Paul Newman, brilliant. Yeah, what we got here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> Did you see the documentary about um, Paul Newman and his wife? It was, uh, it was great. It was like Joanne a five, Woodward. Yeah, it's like a five part documentary. No, I haven't. Brilliant. Brilliant. I've read. I read some stuff about them, yeah, and yeah. you know, first of all, you know the enduring Hollywood romance mm -hmm. and marriage. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's this sex symbol and megastar, mm -hmm. alcoholic. Was he an alcoholic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she. Um... Did you bring that up because I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> He I says, see, laughing, <laughs> masking the pain. Tea. Tea's a fine drink. Tea is, Tea's a tea fine is my saviour. Yeah. Um, it's so much better than day drinking. But I, I, like, I like the fact, though, that you're able to incorporate a lot of those, um, I don't know, do you call them shortcomings? Like drinking into your stand-up and into your work and able to deal with it in a, mm. in a creative way. And it's also, there's a... There's a Currently, you know, in my life, I've I've stopped, and mm. I'm a happy person. I'm happier. Oh, uh, you're looking good. I feel good. You got a glow. But I didn't know that Newman struggled with the demon drink. Oh yeah, big time, big time. All the way through, or um, did he quit? No, no, I think I think it got worse later on. But then, he, yeah, then he then he quit. Like, right. Yeah, like seventies. He was. Did he, he was, quit around the pasta sauce time? Was that because sometimes yeah, you know once yeah. you overcome an addiction. You think, well, I've been wasting all this time on myself. Maybe it's time channel? to give back to the yes. community, but also where can I channel the energy? Yes. And I wonder if that was a moment because the pasta sauce was, I'm going to put my face on this, but every Everything. cent of it goes to charity. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and he didn't make a big deal about it. Like, it's, just, it's what I'm doing. No. Like, it's not, it didn't, he wasn't, like, you know, singing from the rooftops every chance he got about it. I reckon I saw it, you know, because I, I've always been, like, mad for TV. And so mm. in the post... Um, high school or post-secondary school unemployed years mm. before I became a customs officer, I would watch everything. And in, in also in the 90s when I was a, you know, um, drama school stoner. Uh, so I reckon I first saw The Pasta Sauce on Donahue right. or one of those, you know, pre-Oprah type talk shows because mm -hmm. there was a few around at the time. There was, Donahue was kind of the first, you know, going into the audience and chatting about issues like, we've yeah, got Joel yeah. here today and he's a sexual dysfunction expert who wants to talk about sex. It's like, my husband can't get a hard on. Yeah. And What uh, are your thoughts on that, yeah. Dr. Osborne? What do you feel about the hard on? <laughs> Is there too much pressure on men? <laughs> and um, also Ricky Lake. Ricky Lake, yeah. And, and then Oprah. Oprah came in there and Sally, it, yeah. Sally Jesse, Jesse Raphael. Raphael. And yeah. then Springer came in and just oh, kicked yeah. the door and, down. Yeah. Reinvented the fall. Yes. And Springer was amazing. Um, Geraldo as well. Yes. I don't think we did got much Geraldo here. No. I think uh, every week we did... Why was I aware of Geraldo? When I was younger, I knew of him, though. I don't know right. why. Yeah. When was the first time he went to the States? Because Geraldo, you would have seen him oh, in the um, States. Oh, 97 was right, the first okay. time I went. Yeah. Maybe Geraldo was late night here. You know, on 10 or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just knew of him for some reason. And... Maybe it was something to do with John Lennon. Like, I know that he was connected to John Lennon in some way. Like yeah. friends, Lennon and Geraldo, or was he like an advocate N for him? Yeah, I think he was an advocate for him during the whole um, movement. Well, uh, he got 
Back in he the had 70s. trouble getting U.S. citizenship when yeah. he moved to New York, and he was being followed and surveillance right. by the FBI. And yeah, Nixon really had it in for him. Yeah, those, and, and, those peaceniks. Anyone, anyone that prophesizes peace and yeah. love is all you need, they're, they're on, they're yeah. on the hit list. Yeah, unfortunately. Imagine, imagine Dick. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's um, it, it is interesting when you actually you just mentioned something before. I want to get back to that. You worked with dogs in in the in customs, right? The sniffer yes. dogs, right? Yeah. Now, would you have a bond with the dogs? Like what? Yeah, would, yeah. Would, so you, um, you bond is essential when you work with a working dog. Yeah. Whether it's a police dog and a, or a policeman or a customs officer in my case and a drug detector dog or a farmer and his kelpie, the bond is everything mm. because you rely on the dog or the dog relies on you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so would the dog be able to smell drugs on me? Well, I wouldn't be carrying drugs or, you know, dressed in clothes from the weekend. Right. <laughs> Maybe, no, mm. Mm. Did, you, did you have a couple of cones on the weekend? Um, and so the process to find the drugs was a game. And the game starts as a tug of war with a towel dummy. And then you introduce the odour. So you tie drugs to the end of it. So it's part of the, he, his olfactory system is relating the odour to the game. Right. This is fun. And right. you start it with the process, sit, find it. And then he would treat. find the dummy. Well, no, the dummy is the treat. Oh. Playing with, oh, playing right. with okay, and okay. swinging around and having fun okay. and this is great. Right. And then I get put away. And then the process starts again. We're going to play that game. So then you would hide behind like a curtain and run him past and he'd pick up the smell. It's like the game's there. Yes. And so you would reduce the amount of narcotic you're using and become more elaborate in your hiding, mm -hmm. like suitcases. And then, you know, we did house busts. So in walls, we had a fake right. house. Right. So they can have an aggressive response and tear the wall and find it in there. So next time they, you know, if someone's hiding something in a car, in a tyre, they have this full-on aggressive response to it. The game's in there. Yes. And then you throw the dummy in because you know that that response needs to be rewarded. Rewarded, right, right. Yeah. And what sort of dogs? So I had a German Shepherd, a yeah. big 40 kilo orange and black German Shepherd called mm -hmm. Grip. <laughs> and I'd... Um, Inherited him from a previous officer that had gone on to become an instructor, and so me and Grip were teamed together for two and a half years. And then I I left to go to the states. What year was this? Nineteen eighty nine, right. and six months in South America. Then I brought back about thirty kilos of pure cocaine, and I've been living off that <laughs> profit. <laughs> Ever since, and, you, and, so, and you're at the airport, and you're Bernie's way too rich <laughs> for a stand-up. Like he comes in a sedan chair <laughs> with uh, people waving. Like, where did he get his money? It's like oh, he was a customs officer. Right. They don't pay much, do they? It's like, no, I studied. Yeah. I studied for six years, and then I put my skills. You made sure you came back on the shift that Grip was on. Yeah, it's like customs. good boy. Yeah. Gave him a good O. Ah, <laughs> Dad's here. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, I like, see, you delayed gratification for over two years, yeah. building up to that. That is, that is something that a, a true criminal is able to do, isn't it? The long form mm. payoff. Mm -hmm. and, and when we go, let's go back to cop movies and tropes, mm -hmm. that's where it, it really is. The, the kingpin that has got all these pieces in play and doesn't get involved. Just waits. Just waits mm, and it patient. pays off. Yes. I went and saw Fran Lee Witz on Sunday night. I saw her on... Um, on... I don't know. No, yeah, Sunday night. Was it Sunday night? I, I, saw, saw, I saw, saw her in Melbourne on Sunday. Oh, I saw her in Sydney. On Monday. In the week. Yeah. I loved it, but I was... I loved it. I'm not going to go... No, go on. Go on. What was your first thought then? Um, look, the first half hour was an in conversation with... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the in conversation with frustrated me because I'm a massive fan mm -hmm. and I've read everything there is to read mm -hmm. and I've watched the Netflix series and mm -hmm. I'm into her. And I first came to her um, through a magazine called Acne Magazine. 
big mm. uh, kind of like big form magazine from New York mm -hmm. and opened it up. And I'd heard of Fran, you know, kind of like through Annie Leibowitz and knew who she was, but there she was in this magazine talking about New York City. So I loved what she had to say. Mm -hmm. Everything about you've got a responsibility as a citizen in a city to, you know, serve that city's reputation, mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff. So big fan, went along and saw someone in conversation with her that I I wanted to be in conversation with her. Yes. There was FOMO. You had the questions that you wanted to Yeah. yeah. And um, the woman who was in conversation with her, and I don't want to name her because I think she's a great woman and she does amazing work in her chosen field. Mm -hmm. But she asked her about her outfit. It's like, God, you don't know Fran Lee Woods yeah, yeah. if you want to talk fashion. Because yes. she wants to talk about her cowboy boots for a bit. But yes. And the shirt and the jacket and the pants. Right, right. You, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Heartbreaking waste mm -hmm, of time. Mm -hmm. But when Fran got up, she then took... For the Q&A. For the Q&A. But the mm. Q&A was on a screen. Right. And I'd seen her in conversation with Scorsese on the Netflix series. Mm -hmm. And, of course, she takes questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. And she can live on her feet. She's mm -hmm. a comic. Mm -hmm. And so there's these Q&As coming up on a screen that she's reading. And I thought, was that because of the situation in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine, was that to stop, you know, maybe protest questions or aggressive questions, but even so, Fran Lebowitz can but she, deal with her own Jewishness I've or read, the situation in Israel. Yeah, but I've read about that. She's been asked that question before, and she goes, I don't get involved in the Middle East, next question. Yeah. You know, and she would, that's, I'm sure that's how she would have dealt with it. I had the same question, thinking that same thing too, with the because there was a different person um, asking questions uh, of her um, in Sydney. But it was getting around to stuff about Trump, and it kept on getting back to Trump. I'm like, I'm sick of it. I don't want to, you know, yes, you've answered it in the first question. Let's move on, you know. Like yeah, to, she got some to, Q and questions in the Q&A on the screen. For, for, okay. She goes, Donald Trump, he, he's not my fault. Yeah, yeah. He's not yeah. my fault. Yeah. I'm from New York. I know people that know him. Yeah. And one of the best responses she got was, he, he's renowned for being a liar and a cheat. You know, you don't get involved with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, uh, Donald Trump is repudiated by other developers. Property developers. Property yeah. developers. Do you know how bad you have to be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she did that one when I saw yeah. it. She, she's, got, like, she's got her material. It's good though. Yeah, she's it's got strong. her shtick. Yeah, yeah. Don't you worry about that. Yeah. But um, back to our original point, why I was going to talk about... Uh, Fran. Fran. Yeah. I can't remember. Ah. I, can't, well, I can't remember. Well, uh, it's hilarious. My, my, um, we met her afterwards uh, in the Sydney one. And the photo that you I... met her? Yeah, the photo I took of my wife and her. I, I have to show you afterward. It is hilarious. I sent it to a friend in New York and he goes, that is hilarious. Like, my wife's my... And Fran's just... Right. <laughs> just deadpan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's what you would expect. That's what you would... It's the perfect photo to... To um, to highlight, you know, Fran, Fran, literally. and although th there was bits, you know, where I was like, oh God, I want more. All week, little things that she's been saying yeah. have been coming back yes. and dropping in. Yeah. So when she was talking about, you know, as a kid, all I wanted to do was go to the Museum of Modern Art. I wanted to go to Mona. Yeah. Um, MoMA. <laughs> um, and she goes, and there was another place that I wanted to go was a toy shop. I can't remember the name of the toy shop, but it was a big Jewish was name. You know. F.A. Schwartz? Yeah. yeah. F, 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 yeah, no, F-O, F, F, Q, Schwartz. Or yeah. There used to be a big one near the Plaza Hotel, I remember. And she said, um, her parents said to her once, you've never, whenever we go to that toy shop, you never ask for anything. You never ask for a single thing. And she goes, I thought it was a museum. So there was something that you were going to say about Fran. Yeah, um, and it just popped back to me. We were talking about, the mastermind criminal having the long game mm -hmm. and having all the pieces in play and de deferring gratification. Well, somebody either asked Fran about being vengeful mm. or uh, it just came up in conversation. And she said, yeah, I'm vengeful. I'm vengeful. I think it's one of the great joys in life to just wait for it. I was like, 
oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you have no idea why you didn't get that scholarship from the university or the, the tuition job. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Yeah, playing that long game. Playing the long game eventually. Mm. Mm. Are you a vengeful person? No, you're no, not a vengeful I, person. I always, what a stupid question. <laughs> I always look at it, how much weight do I want to carry in my life? And I think for having revenge and those vengeful, it's too much weight to carry. I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to carry that. Yeah. You know. It's. I like, get that. I. I would rather a, just. And it's it. also shadow self. You, you're inviting the shadow self in, and in terms of weight, mm. it's, it's lighter to be in the light. Right. Right. And 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 less things to think about and consider. There's enough things to worry about in this world, other than. Like, I, this is what I was like. Everyone has to live with themselves, right? And people that are nasty, let's say someone does the wrong thing by you and they're like one of those sort of people, they've got their own bullshit to live with and deal with. Yeah, yeah. And no one's really, free of conscience, are they? In the middle of the night, it's, it's coming out of the woodwork in some way. Yeah. And even if they say, oh, I don't feel it, it's coming out. It's, yeah, it's, and, that, and that's what that, that karmic circle is. You're carrying your own karmic circle, aren't you? It's coming for you. Mm-hmm. So I, I just look at it as, as, yeah, okay, go play crazy someplace else. You know? I um, go to Instagram for my um, spiritual guidance. <laughs> and my wife's like, are you reading another <laughs> list of six things? Yeah, don't complain, don't criticize, right. no negativity, uh. don't gossip, no excuses. I like those kind of mantras. But they, I was watching this guru um, not sad guru. Yeah, sad guru. Oh, he's not. Is he okay? Oh no! <laughs> Look, I, uh, I have my question. I saw him. I saw, saw him. him. <laughs> you gave him At money. The tennis. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give him money. I was like, uh, no, I wasn't at the tennis. I saw him. Oh, you saw him at he was. Yeah, he at, was at the Australian oh, Open. Oh, he was at the Australian Open. And yeah, yeah. There's Zed Guru, and he was also doing an Australian tour, I think, yeah. at the time. Yeah. But anyway, he speaks uh, and quotes the Buddha a lot, and one of the things that I've been rehashing that I got from Sad Guru. Sadhguru, was um, anger in terms of being lightness. And he goes, the Buddha equates anger or holding onto anger as reaching into the fire and grabbing a hot coal mm. and holding it in your hand. The only person holding onto anger is hurting is you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great analogy. Sure. Because that's, nobody else knows you're angry unless you're busy telling them mm -hmm. or publicizing it. So you've got to let it go. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a great analogy. So well, regardless of his reputation or any previous actions, just that gift is quite freeing. Mm -hmm. So there's so some What you're saying points. is you could have just read about the Buddha and cut out the middleman. I could have read about the Buddha. And I could have got off Instagram. But <laughs> Instagram, for all its faults, delivered me the message too. So... Mm. That's it's funny that you say it because... Um, but I, I do a lot of spirituality time on Insta. <laughs> so my, where my, I find my zen. And my, yes, my soul is being cleansed, but my neck is being <laughs> fucked. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, Simon Kennedy, who's a lovely guy. I know Simon, yeah. he's terrific. He, um, we were talking about that and you know, I read his book, which was really inspiring for someone who's been through the depths of darkness, you know, with the situation with his mother being killed on September 11th. Um, yes. Go, her, right, who she was yeah. on the plane that went into the Pentagon. And just him <sighs> dealing with that. And the fact that there's, a, there's a, in one of the closing chapters in the book, he's in Guantanamo seeing the guy who orchestrated the 9-11 attacks um, on trial. And so he's there looking at this guy who, you know, essentially inadvertently killed his mother, right? But Simon just doesn't hold resentment, doesn't hold revenge, doesn't hold... There's a sadness there like for someone that would do that. And for Simon to come to that place to think, this guy's not only ruined his own life, but he's got a family with kids. 
and their lives are going to be ruined now from his actions, as well as the victims of. So he he, he has yeah, a, the, the the ripples go to the right. edge of the pond. Right, and he, and Simon gave an example, which is basically similar to what you said. He said, revenge, holding re reven resentment and revenge and hatred, is like you taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yes, I think that's uh, Einstein. Right. Yeah, vengeance is. Yeah. Drinking poison and waiting for the other person to yeah. die. Or Turing, Alan Turing, who b b bit the apple and died from poison. Einstein's mate, right? Right. <laughs> or did he kill his friend? <laughs> no, no. He 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 ate the he ate the apple and then um, the the Enigma code. You know the guy yeah. who cracked the uh, he a cyanide apple. Oh. And then they and I believe that's where Apple. Well, it's said that's where Apple got their logo from. Um, from the the no, bite. They stole apple, it off so. the Beatles. Well, yeah, but the bite but, out of the apple. Ah. Uh, yeah. So they saw maybe from both of them. Now, what, they're, a, they're a corporation, aren't they? Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're something else. They, they are something else. Yeah. Hey, you know that thing we just sold you? It's obsolete already. <laughs> Get a new computer home, and it'll just like update your software. Yeah. Update your software. It's like, I have just walked out of the shop with this thing. Right. This piece of Shit. And now that I've updated it, my system won't Work. support it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect scam. So in the 80s, we never had to worry about any of these issues. Oh. We never had to worry about any of that. How free <laughs> were we? And how much time did we have on our hands right. that we did? Well, when you say nothing, with we went to all those movies and we watched all those talk shows. We remembered we, phone numbers. We, yeah. we, we conversed. You know, and also too... We remembered phone numbers. And, well, that's an interesting point. And we daydreamed. No one yeah. daydreams anymore. And there's a, a friend of mine... That's um, a good point. Just staring out the window, letting your mind run. That's where the gold is. Where is the gold? It's, it's it, out there. It's in the daydreams. <laughs> you daydream, you go to the end of the dream. And there, right there is your pot of gold. Just waiting there. It's just sure. yours. It's yours. It's got your name on it. And do you know who's at the end of the rainbow? You, you are. Waiting there <laughs> with your pot of gold. You can't do that in an Australian accent. No, no. Mate, where's where the fucking gold? Yeah, it's at the end. You're at the... At, and do you know who's at the end of the rainbow? Mm. Fucking you are. <laughs> you are. No, you are. No, you are. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> what are you doing at the end of my rainbow? No, no, me. I'm telling you. you ah, yeah, I get it. I haven't it. seen a rainbow in years out here. We haven't had rain since 1973. <laughs> don't worry about it, no, Doug. Forget it. Forget it. It's an analogy, yeah. though. Yeah. Who? Look, look, just don't, don't, and don't take poison. It's only going to affect you, all right? Oh, that bloke, yeah. the Enigma Code. Yeah. I liked that movie, but he was, you know... An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, you not know. in his case. You know. No, I don't know. What, what's that? He had a stiff neck? Or he was homosexual? Just say it, Dad. <laughs> he was a homosexual. You know? He... Yeah. yeah. But he saved a lot of lives. Mm. He did. Well, Except for the brother of the guy he was working with. He said, my brother's on that boat. We've got to... He said, well, if we tell them now... Yes. I don't know, we've cracked the code That's and they'll right. change the code. Sacrifice. We've got to listen. Mm. Which brings us back to Buddha. I remember there was an example that was given, you should not kill, never kill, right? Don't kill people. And an example was given, if you're on a boat and you've got seven other people and you've got one person, they've got a sword and they're going to kill everyone, but you are able to kill that person who has the sword, what do you do? Well, you kill the person who has a sword to save the seven lives. And Buddha said, yeah, that's what you'd do. Oh. So Buddha Advocated. will have a little bit of collateral damage. In order to save the bigger picture. So in a way, maybe he was, uh, you know, channeling the Buddha. What about this for the lifeboat? I heard this story once about a uh, lifeboat that ended up with one survivor on it. It finally gets back to... The shore. And there was a fox and a chicken on it? No. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this Indian guy, his name's Pi. And uh, <laughs> no, they s said, um, you know, what happened? And he said, we were, ship sank, we were all on the boat. 
mm. and the, the captain or the commanding officer at, was, had taken control of the boat. Mm. And so we're going that way and everyone's, you know, rowing with their hands or rowing. And one person lost their ship and said, we're going the wrong way. It's been days, we're going the wrong way, we're going the wrong way. Mm. And started sowing the seed of doubt mm. in other people. And eventually the boat turns into a horrific melee and people are killing one another and it's just by one dissenter mm. saying losing doubt. Seed of doubt. Now, even if you are going the wrong way, you've got to just suck it up. Unless you're an expert at um, astrological aviation, um, navigation. Mapping, yeah. Yeah, mapping. Or, you know, the, you know, like the South Pacific wayfarers could tell with the temperature of the water mm. when to change direction. Mm -hmm. Shut your gob. Shut your gob unless you're sure. Yes. But Shut your fucking gob <laughs> unless you're sure about what's going to happen next. <laughs> that, 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 is, that, is, uh, that should be the name of your next show, I think. Shut your fucking gob. Yeah, unless you know. <laughs> Shut your gob unless that, you know. Because that, that would be, that would solve so many, that, well, not, that would, 90% of forums online or Twitter feeds would, would be non-existent if that yeah. was, if that was the case. A lot of conspiracy theorists would also say, well, you got to look into it. You don't know because you don't look into it. Or do your research. They, they, they're mm. great for that. Do My next biography would, is going to be called Next Time I Die. Next Time I Die. Right. I like that. Because, uh, yeah, this, this comedy show that's coming up is about me. I died. When did this happen? Uh, earlier this year. What? Yeah. Well, Not a lot of people know, so a bit of a scoop for the, the please, podcast. Uh, please tell me. So I, and this is when I stopped drinking, I really pissed. I fell down and smacked my head and not breathing, no pulse. Cl clinically dead? Well, not clinically. Uh, revived by a restaurateur who was with me and fell in, and he came over and he said, nothing going on. So he started performing CPR. Wow. And brought me back. And, w and w what did you experience? Oh, nothing. So... So I, I don't. I don't know whether there was enough time to go to, to the, go line. To the others. To go to the other <laughs> side. <laughs> I was okay. waiting for the revelation. There, it's like. Uh, no, yeah. the revelation is. The revelation is, I'm alive, mm. and it's delicate, and it's temporary, and there's an irrefutable fact that we're all going to die. And the idea that it can happen mm. that, through, that through misadventure, mm. you know, that easily and stupidly um, and has made me just relish the idea once you fully contemplate the idea of your own death and you think, you know, anything that you, can, you complain about is sensory most of the time. So you go, oh, God, you know, it's such a hot day outside. Like, the, the idea that you can feel the mm. heat on your skin, mm. that's not forever. Or the wind in your hair, or that you can see traffic. You know, everything that you enjoy in this life is sensory. Enjoy every bit of it. Mm. You know, whether it's whatever it is. Just, so yeah. So there's a, so the show that I'm about to do, Pigeonhole, it was all about being pigeonholed and pigeonholing other people and, you know, by extension, the way we look out into social media and, mm. and the world. So it was basically a whole lot of stuff about that. And then I was delivered this gift, if you will, mm. of I was going to talk about, you know, being pigeonholed as a bit of a drunkard and party animal and, you know, loose unit and all that mm. stuff. And I, I don't want to be that anymore. Like, well, good for you, Lawrence. It's great. got a use-by date. In sure. fact, a long time ago, you gave me a book called 
the knife's edge. Razor's edge. Raise, razor's edge. Somerset Sorry, Maul. Maul. Yeah. Mm. And I think that that was along the same lines of like, you know, a bit of raised consciousness. Sure. That's great, right. mate. It's great for you to have, you know, the sense to recognize that and to make a conscious decision about... So, a, yeah, to make a decision. Because, you know, I've had friends that have, like, lived wild lives and, and they just kept on going and they're no longer with us, you know, and so... And what took them out in the end? Poor health or yeah. their own hand? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or health, yeah. Yeah. And maybe it can be argued and the same thing that you're tacitly trying to kill yourself anyway by yeah, it's like, drinking yourself to death. It's like Montgomery Cliff, you know, they say the slowest suicide in Hollywood, you know. Mm. you got those sort of people that, you know, they're, they're brilliant in what they do, but they're so self-destructive. And, and it's hard to watch. And at the end of the day, it's like it's their decision, you know. It's like you can talk to your blue in the face trying to yeah. give some kind of, sense of advice or counsel but and you know. somewhere inside that person knows what they're doing yeah and jack kerouac said the same thing he was um he died at the age of i think 47 mm. he was when he died and he went home to live with his mum and he said i'm a catholic i can't commit suicide so i'm going to drink myself to death and that's what he did and in the end he died of a a gut hemorrhage mm. I went, I went to the bar that uh, Vesuvio's. You probably did you go there next to City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco? Yes. There's a bar that Kerouac used to hang in. Yeah, and I went with downstairs. Ginsburg and, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I went downstairs to the oh, toilet and there's this big portrait of yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a, I always like that going to places and so, walking in the footsteps in the neighborhoods that these yeah. greats used to. I went where, where Tennessee Williams used to live in. Um, in St. Louis, uh, I went to that neighbourhood where his tenement building used to be, and just walking around there and you'd seeing the cinema that he would. Ah, oh, that's what he referred to in the Glass Menagerie. That would have right. been the cinema. Yes. He went, you know, just discovering all these things. Yeah, I always find that. So I went to City Lights. Yeah. And then I went to the bar, and then I went to the museum across the road, the Beat Museum. Yeah, yeah. they got the first copy of Howl in there, the first yeah. copy of On the Road, all these iconic. And a big. Uh, the, like Hudson that they would have driven across, that Cassidy drove across yes. the States, but I don't think it's the original. No. And, but he told me where the original was, I can't remember now, but I was just kind of in there alone for most of the time. The guy was obviously, you know, a beat aficionado mm -hmm. and just running me through everything. It was great. Yeah. And it's so uh, up there in that um, North Beach area, across from the strip clubs, you got the Beat Museum. It's like, yeah, perfect. Perfectly yeah. placed. God, San Francisco is a wonderful place. Mm. I really dig that yeah. joint. That, that building just down the road from there is one of my favourite buildings in San Francisco. The um, where Zotrope Films is, the Zotrope oh, building yeah, yeah, on the yeah. corner, and there's the Italian restaurant, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's uh, restaurant underneath. Right. There. And one night, I remember it was a rainy night, and I walked out of there, and I was walking by, and I see this old guy sitting there just with a water bottle by himself, and I look, and it's Francis Ford Coppola, and we made eye contact. And I just said, hi, and he went, hi, and I, that's all that's needed, and just kept on walking. And it's a nice and little does he, is he a, does a San Franciscan, is he a... Yeah, well, he's got like a vineyard like um, there in, uh, in, in the area, um, and yeah, he owns, that's his building, so that's where Zotrope Films operates out of, their offices. And How can't my manager to organise me some gigs in San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, why not? They're yeah. great crowds in San Fran. The Punchline, in, that's a great venue. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my favourites. So. Yeah, I just had a kind of, you know, growing up in Melbourne, there was a couple of similarities to San Fran, you know. It's like everywhere else is sunny and it's cloudy here. Mm. And there's this kind of strong culture of writers and, mm -hmm. and artistic history. Mm -hmm. Alleyways. Yeah. Little cobblestone streets. Anywhere that's got that, you know, it's going to be a... Yeah, a little... Like you say, speakeasies, but cinemas and and some of the great breakfasts too. Mm, mm. There's, there's that Cafe Trist up there on the corner where Coppola wrote a lot of worked on a lot of the screenplay for. Um, I can't remember the place we went to, but it was in the kind of like the gay neighbourhood, if you will. Yeah, and it was just wonderful. But also that whole history too, you know, Harvey Milk and yes, the the gay history of San Francisco. Yeah. 
which all, you know, when, whenever there's a place that uh, is driven forward by that, it's about liberation and freedom. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they're freedom fighters mm -hmm. that want us all to be free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when there's equality, we are all set free. Sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very, uh, it was such a groundbreaking town in its time. And it's kind of sad to see, you know, the immense homelessness and drug use there now. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's like that. There's, there's a great book called um, Ring Livio by um, Emmett Grogan. And he was behind the, um, he was one of the main figures in the counterculture movement. He was originally from New York and he moved to San, he went to Europe but then went to San Fran. And he set up a group called the Diggers. And they basically fed all the homeless people in Golden Gate Park during the 60s. Because a lot of these people, you know, the old um, dropout, tune in, dropout, yeah, yeah. Know, they went out there. But there was so, the homelessness in the 60s was r rampant in. in uh, oh, because everyone came for the summer of love. Right. But and then, then were lost or drug addicted. Or, right. Right. Yeah, okay. and, and so he set up this whole, but he never wanted to be a part of it, right? He didn't, yeah. he didn't, want, he didn't want to be at the forefront of this movement. And, and he was very critical of a lot of the people in that counterculture movement too, the hippie movement or whatever you want to yeah. call it. And he, he questioned very much the, uh, you know, the, the motives behind a lot of these people. But he was very good friends with Ginsburg. So Allen Ginsburg invited him to London to give a talk at this, uh, and it was, everyone had heard about this Emmett Grogan, you know, the talk was on the, on the streets right. of a packed out, massive town hall. And he just, before he went on, he was just saying, I question these people, you know, they listen to the singer, but not to the song. And he got up there that Good night. Good point. Yeah, and he gave this speech. People are applauding, cheering, all behind him, right? And at the end he says, you know, I appreciate the enthusiastic response that you've all given, but I can't take credit for this speech that I've just delivered because I've just recited an Adolf Hitler speech. So good luck to you all. Good night. Goodbye. And he took off. Wow. And they tore the place apart, right? They were so enraged by the, that they had been put up. And it just proved his point perfectly. And he, um, and later on, uh, Bob Dylan dedicated an album, Street Legal, to Emmett Grogan. But he was oh. he always shunned the kind of, the so a truly cool dude. Yeah, but then he, he turned up on the train one day, um, dead on the train from a heroin overdose. Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't, you know, didn't end well for him, but he... Emmett is, Grogan. Yeah. And what's the name of the book? Ring Levia. Ring Levia. Yeah. That, uh, it does ring a bell, that stunt. But isn't it interesting that he reads out an Adolf Hitler speech the crowd are full of adulation. Mm. Then he reveals the deceit mm -hmm. or the conceit. And they can't enjoy that. They can't go, oh, no, he's we just... are so in. Yeah. No, but people don't want to look at the mirror, you know? Yeah. Th they destroy the joy. <laughs> yeah, they, they were enraged. And that was his last public appearance. Yeah. You know, he just said, I'm going to go out in a bang here. That's a ripper. Immediately, yeah. I'm thinking. I've got to get a copy of Mein Kampf and start doing <laughs> Start reciting that. So I'll I'm doing kill some at the Hitler, festival. Yeah. <laughs> Hitler gags. Yeah. And it's like, yay, it's hilarious. Yeah, well, that was all from Mein Kampf. <laughs> and everyone goes, nah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, Australians uh, are too ambivalent to destroy a joint after having a trick played on them. Yeah, go, yeah. Oh, ah, come on, mate. Ah, come on, Mooney. He got us. The moon man, he got yeah, us again. He got us a beauty. <laughs> He's reading Hitler. Oh, I'm in stitches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hitler's pretty funny. <laughs> well, he I had that funny. He, yeah, well, he, he saw it work for Chaplin for so many years. Yeah, that's what I'll need. Which came first? Chaplin. Chaplin's moustache came first. Yeah, yeah, Chaplin, you know, silent film. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the tramp. Yeah, yeah. It was the tramp. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, right. cha it's crazy. And Chaplin was like, in that time. I don't know to keep going like that. <laughs> Everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Cha Chaplin was, uh, the magnitude, of, I, I do a routine about this, just about the, just how frivolous the pursuit of fame for the sake of fame is. And I, I use Chaplin as an example of that. You know, like in his time, it didn't get any bigger than Chaplin. He was like the most recognizable in the world because he translated language barriers. I've seen a documentary history. about Chaplin somewhere. Yeah. 
Is it? Because the part of that story is they had this lookalike competition that he went in. I've heard of this. And yeah, he, yeah, and he yeah. Came eighth yeah. or ninth. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you're good, but you're not chaplain. But yeah. Yeah, they talk about how big it was. Oh, really, the people would, thousands and thousands of people would wait for him to arrive on a train. Yeah, into a town, yeah. yeah. I, I went to this exhibition in, in Moscow, this is like over a decade ago, and it was just on chaplain in this museum. And it was some of the most incredible photos of him. You see these photos with a sea of people, you know, that, that are waiting yeah. outside his hotel room or at a, at a train station or just... Like, and in that time too, like, I don't think people appreciate the magnitude because he, it wasn't just in the Western world, it was everywhere who, you know, everyone knew Chaplin across the... Yeah, when you say Moscow, it's interesting how, you know, it will span a culture like... Right, yeah, yeah. there's a whole massive Charlie exhibition. Charlie yeah, 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 he, he was a pretty funny guy, you know. Privet, Charlie. Yeah. Privet, Privet. 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 Privet, I saw it on the microfilm. Yes. <laughs> Not so funny for Navalny. No, no. I was so sad when I heard that he died. Right. And I thought, you know, when he returned to Russia from Germany, I thought, you know, it was insane and everyone did. And he knew that he was... The risks. Gonna, well, he knew that he was going to die. I think it was a, a deliberate act of a true martyr. Mm, yeah. To say this... My absence or being, you know, an exile isn't going to shine a light on it mm. like my death will. Mm. Mm. And um, I just hope it, you know, it's true. Mm. I heard somebody say recently they were somewhere and Vladimir Putin was a appearing and they were close to Putin and he came through and he was, he's a tiny man. Yeah, yeah. They said the most remarkable thing about him was the size of his head. It looks like an orange, like it's a tiny head. Really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, I know that in well, this evolved got... times, you yeah. know, it's 2024, yeah. we shouldn't be laughing yeah. or mocking a man for the size of his head. But fuck that guy. <laughs> With his citrusy bonds. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it was a grapefruit, yeah. it's still a tiny head. Yeah. There's not a citrus fruit big enough no. for <laughs> Vladimir Putin's head. Lime head. He's a limey. So Putin, who in the 80s was a major force in the KGB, mm -hmm. now in the 80s a major force in the music industry here in Australia was your selection for this podcast of your favourite oh. album. Right. I, I know it's an interesting uh, uh, link I just did there from Putin to the Sunny Boys, but please tell us about your favourite album. So, uh, Sunny Boys, eponymously named. That's probably why I chose it, because I just wanted to be able to say eponymously for the rest <laughs> of my life. So, the Oxley Brothers, and uh, they were kind of... I guess post-punk outfit mm. out of New South Wales. But why did I choose this? Because this album is the first album that I bought with my own money. So I'd received some records mm -hmm. for Christmas um, from Father Christmas over the, the years. But in 1981, this was the first one that I bought with my own money. And uh, I'd heard... The I think the first single off the album was Happy Man. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second single was Alone With You. But it's just such a great record and played it on my brother's record player. And my older brothers had really influenced my music listening. I suppose so, it was the only thing that we were listening to was their music. Right. So so what were you into? Like What, what, was, what was that? Dylan, yep. Neil Young, mm -hmm. Crazy Horse, mm -hmm. uh, they were also a lot of Credence, Great. Joan Baez, the whole oeuvre of the 60s, mm. Beatles, Stones, um, more kind of experimental stuff, uh, Yes, mm -hmm. Horse Lips, um, Pavlov's Dog, uh, and then Meatloaf, of course, came along. With the Bad Out of Hell. That Out of Hell album got a lot of play. Like you, you hear, like it seems like everyone had that 
back in the back in the seventies. Yeah, it was. Had that album. If, if you go through someone's record collection, there is there a big is. chopper. Yes, Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell. But um, this was my pride and joy. This album, and also, Sunny Boys was something that we would buy from the, the canteen or the tuck shop. Yeah, on a uh, summer's day. Yeah, the triangular yeah. tetra pack. But you'd suck all of the, <laughs> the, the goodness, juice out. all the juice and out of it. And throw the ice block <laughs> away. And uh, inside that tetra pack, sometimes on the silver foil would be printed a yellow freebie. So oh, you'd get yeah. a free. Yeah. And so I think the, the flavours were orange was the sunny boy. Mm -hmm. There was a glug which was advertised as Indian juice, which was a cola flavour. Right. Um, Raz was raspberry, mm. and there was, well, there was a pineapple one. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was pineapple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Sunny God, Boys. I'm just. This just taking me back to the canteen at school. Yeah. You know, going up to the canteen, getting a Sunny Boy. They'd get the scissors and cut the top. But if the scissors had been like cutting garlic or something before, it would have that ah, or or, or, or like yeah. onions or whatever. You know, that taste, that initial taste from the scissors. I remember. And if they had just got a new delivery of Frozen's, and they weren't frozen properly, and they'd cut it, yeah. and it's just all juice <laughs> Glug. with a half piece of ice in there yeah. so, this is, <laughs> so you just had to drink, drink it <laughs> kind of like a tepid juice yeah. <laughs> so um yeah i still listen to the sunny boys and that album god it's just so beautiful mm. and simple on warner music i think it's a great cover oh, that's there it the, is you know it's just, but it, it's the early days of cut and paste really yes that photo is... You can see in the shoe, it's like a hard edge. Yeah. Cut, you know? <laughs> Someone's cut around that and then, oh, look what we're doing. We've cut out the background yeah. and we've got that beautiful blue, but the blue is magnificent too. Yeah. So that's it, the Sunny Boys. It's my first album. Did you ever um, see them? I've never seen... Oh, yes, I did see them. When they reformed? No, no. Oh. Uh, early days. So you saw them in their heyday? I saw them in their heyday. Wow. It was a big ticket. Um... Police were playing at the Melbourne showgrounds, and the lineup was Kids in the Kitchen, mm. Sunny Boys. Mm -hmm. So that was mega to mm. be able to see a band I loved. And by that stage, not a lot of people were taking notice. You know, they're like the crowd was formed yeah. and ready for a big afternoon. Right. A lot of weed being smoked. Aussie Crawl, so Kids in the Kitchen, yeah. Sunny Boys, Aussie Crawl. Mm -hmm. Before the police came out, Brian Adams. Really? Was the support. Wow. And he got booed. And he just cut up rough and just like, fuck you, Australia. Really? Here's my last song. And then the police came out and played through the twilight into the night. And uh, the, those first two albums, Regatta de Blanc and Outlandus de Amour, mm -hmm. had been massive in Australia. Right, right. And I think it was before um, maybe Ghost in the Machine... Right. It was already out, 1982, 83. Um, but they were the world's biggest act, the police. They were huge. I saw Sting last year when he was out here. He's still great. Like, his voice, like, is spot on. And I'm looking at him, I'm going, He's I'm kind of, uh, still got that smoky talk. No, yeah. I'm not doing an American <laughs> accent. No, smoky talking voice, you know. Yeah, yeah. He, he, but he looks incredible. He's in his 70s and he, he's ripped. He's got the buys. He's well, like, he was you know, an early adopter of yoga amongst the, yes. the glitterati. Yeah. And also, um, you know, boasted about practicing tantric, tantric. Yeah. tantric sex, which is your deferring your gratification. Yeah, there you it? go, yeah. 14 so, hours uh, later. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, that he wouldn't even... Need hydration. Orgasm. Yeah, yeah. Well, not hydration. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, well, no, you would because you're exercising, but you're not yeah. blowing your load. <laughs> <laughs> Said like a true premature ejaculator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, um, yeah he, still, he still brings it, uh, the old sting. So that's great that you saw, because they did reform. Did you see the documentary, Sunny Boy? Yes, I've seen the documentary. Yeah, and of course, great. there was some you know, mental health issues. With schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah. in the band. Um, and Jeremy Oxley, you know, yes. has for a long time battled that. But uh, 
that guy could rip it up. Oh, fact, yeah, the, yeah. The whole band were fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. Great, it was great to see um, him find his wife, Mary, who was like, you know, who, who was this sort of angelic figure in his life who brought him back from the darkness and really, you know, had the patience to, uh, you know, to, to really handle him and, and bring him to the light. There's a lot of women whose life work is bringing men back from the darkness. Mm. It's very noble. Yeah. yeah. So thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> ladies. Uh, ladies. Um, yeah, I love that album. Yeah, it's, uh, I, yeah, I've been listening to it. And, it's, it, it, and it's, it still holds up. Like you're li like listening oh, yeah. to it. It's like, yeah. And classic, you know, Oz Rock, yes. guitar driven. Yes. And you can imagine, you know, a seething Kinsella's or Seaview Ballroom or Earl's Court back in the 80s. Mm. Hot, mm. sweaty, people smoking and drinking mm -hmm. beers. Yeah. And Where they know. could come right up to the stage too, yeah. right up to the edge of stage. Got a hang up. I can't communicate. With apologies to the Sunny Boys. You know what was interesting in watching that documentary, though, seeing that um, that Jeremy um, had spent a lot of time in. Uh, Callum Park in Roselle at the Psychiatric Centre. Right. And that, I used to go there when I was a kid on the open day and you could go down into the dungeons underneath and if you weren't nuts going in there, you would be nuts spending time in that environment. Yeah. I, at his time, he was in the other more modernised wards, but we would, um, I remember like in the mid-90s, um, early 90s, after school, we would train at the Oval down there and a bunch of us... Um, school kids would go up and climb the wall and sneak into the old wards in Callum Park there and you could go through and open up the old lockers and there'd still be belongings and things and pictures wow. in, the, in the old lockers. It's interesting that kind of, you know, the, the um, contagion, if you will, of mental illness. If you're around mental illness, you mm. know, in the fullness of time you're going to become mentally ill. If you've got a partner who's a depressive... You're going to take it, that It's going to end up, you know, affecting your life. You might not become a depressive, but you're probably going to end up having some, you know, shared symptoms. Mm. And I, uh, as a schoolboy, was introduced to a homeless shelter in Melbourne called uh, Osnham House, run by St Vincent de Paul, and, uh, or St Vincent de Paul's. And then at, in my 20s, I went back and I thought, I want to volunteer, you know, the Dylan song, What Good Am I, had made an impression on me. It's like, yeah, well, mm. what good am I if I see but don't, no, if I see but don't hear. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's off the O Mercy album. And so I went along. Brilliant album, by the way. Great Mercy. album. Yeah. You know, everything is what, broken. Everything is broken. Political world. Political world. Yeah. Yeah. Is that most, is most of the time on that too? Most of the time. I'm clear all around. Yeah, I think it is, time. yeah. Beautiful song. Um, I've actually revisited that album for music, pre-show music for this show because mm. it just is so impactful on me. Political world would be a good walk-in. We live it in is. a political it's, world. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. It's really fast. Yeah. Articles hanging down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Everything's Broken would be a good walk-in song too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's got some great bongos. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes. so I would go and volunteer at Osnham House. Um, mm -hmm. And the woman who ran it at the time was the mother of uh, uh, Catherine Devaney, writer and comedian. Right. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. But in the end, I was surrounded by such, you know, destitution and addiction and insanity I just felt like that's where I was headed it just felt mm. like a real void and you have to be a strong and very resilient person to work around that and not let it become you. you yeah, yeah and consume you because it was full on and mm. you know this is homeless men drinking all day and then emergency shelter at night mm. so they would feed 300 people a night in two sittings but they couldn't house all of them I think the 
the place held about 150 beds, which was a lot. Sure. But yeah, that's a lot of lost and broken men. And it was a men's only um, shelter. Did, and did you find that it had an impact on you? Like, you know, in terms of the decisions that you made later in life and, you know? Uh, yeah, definitely in terms of, um, I've always been, you know, I stood back from the edge. I've been... Mm. You've looked over. I, I, yeah, I, I haven't gone right to it. Because, mm. I, yeah, I know what is in store. Mm -hmm. And there was people, and I, I was always fascinated with the story, like, how did you get here? Mm -hmm. And there was one guy there who I'd talked to, and, you know, there's varying degrees of mental health issues. And then there's some people amongst the homeless that have chosen to walk away from ordinary life, if you will. Mm -hmm. They can't maintain a job, they can't maintain a house, they can't maintain a, a relationship. And what they're going to do to anaesthetise themselves is drink and they're pretty much strictly alcoholic mm. without attendant mental health issues. So this guy was very lucid about, you know, the way he lived his life, but he had been on the Westgate Bridge when it collapsed. Uh. And so the span that came down killed like, you know, 70 men in uh, the lunch um, huts below it. Mm. It fell on this area that was like the compound. And there were some men on it that surfed the span down. Wow. And so he... and He was one of A those. few of those died on impact. But he was on it, the falling thing. So I would, would ask him and talk to him about that day a bit. And um, I actually wrote some poems about it. Mm. So he, you know, got smashed up quite badly and the trauma yeah. um, completely destroyed his life. But then he walked out of hospital and into a pub and that's the way he was going to choose to live his life. Yeah. And that was 92, 93. Hmm. So I think the bridge had fallen in 71. So it was 21 years later. Right. And so he'd been living that life for a long time. But really, a quite a dignified-looking guy. He always took a little bit of pride in what he was wearing, even though he's, you know, wearing second-hand or donated clothes. He still maintained. And he that. had this kind of poise about him. Mm. And so, amongst the the rabble and the craziness of attendant homelessness and the filth mm. and the madness, this guy stood out. Right. And so, yeah, I'd speak to him, you know, and he had his bottle in a paper bag and there was even a dignity about that. Mm. The way he drank, he was never visibly stumbling drunk. It was just, he's just doing some work mm. over there. Yeah, it, it is. I always find there's something to learn from people that have been through that, you know. Like there's always, like, like you said with your daughter when you, t when you took her down to that park area with all the homeless, mm. there's always, there's a big backstory there. There's, you know, there's a lot that these, that people have gone through to come to that place. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I always found it interesting, like, the, the, like, when I was younger listening to, like, a, a Tom Waits album, and it's those kind of people, these kind of beautiful losers, you know, that, yeah. you, that you don't, that are usually looked over, but no, there's, They've lived a full life. There's something going on there to bring them to that place, you know. When you asked about Osnham House influencing me, in a way, I was drawn to the place because I'm all I've I've always been drawn to damaged people, mm. and um, because of the story, but because of you know just a general sense of humanity, I love the ones that you know have the bent ones, the broken ones, that you know. The, the ones that aren't perfect. In mm. fact, when I met my wife, um, she said, you know, what did you think about me when I, you first met me? One of those questions a woman will ask a man. Yeah, what, did, what was your first impression? impression yeah. And I said, I didn't trust you. Uh, you were way too happy. 
I thought, <laughs> that's bullshit. She goes, oh, that's so sad. And I said, yeah, it is sad that I didn't trust happiness. Mm, mm. You know, because I, as a psychiatrist once told me, you've been attracted to birds with broken wings for a long time, haven't you? Mm. I said, yeah, I am attracted to the bird with the broken wing. And um, maybe they are also attracted to a bird with a broken wing too. Right. I'm not just the healer. It's like... Yeah, that we codependency. Can, yeah, yeah, birds of a feather, if I can continue the analogy. Yes. I mean, pretty fucked up feathers. We've yeah. got broken wings and we're in the mud. We're <laughs> flapping around. Like, choo, One choo, wing. Choo, yeah, choo. Yeah. Can you please pick me up before a cat arrives? <laughs> <laughs> there's, you, you know, there's something about... Um, yeah... It's funny that your show is called Pigeonhole because I have this affinity with pigeons. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the bird that's always shooed away. Like I remember yeah. having lunch at this, um, having a burrito, and this guy saw the pigeon come across him and he went like that at the pigeon. I thought, well, that's the kind of like response, and that just symbolised a guy about a backhand. Who backhands a pigeon? You know, yeah. but that kind of look and pigeons or the, are, the raised foot. Yeah, but I, I always, I always, I'm always one throwing food for the pigeon, giving it a bit of food or... And, and I will champion the pigeon's cause. I, I, yeah, and... and the pigeon makes no demands of you. No, and... and it's and, not like the seagull that... Yeah. <laughs> the pigeon's just like... And, 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 and it's backing away from that and, seagull but, that comes well, at it, you know, the, you know, it swoops and tries to steal its uh, chip. But the pigeon is a such a humble and meek mm. being and they can fly yeah. They choose to come down and condescend to walk with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I, I know you don't have wings. Yeah. I'll cross the road with you. I'll come into the, mm. the milk bar. I'm even just, even I'm with his gimp little, little, yeah. little... Often gimpy. Yeah, gimpy little leg. It's yeah. got someone, no or claw, a, or hops along. Pustuled eyeball. I, and they want to live with us too. You don't see a pigeon nest other than in a man-made structure, like you know, on that horizontal bit of a downpipe or the window ledge mm. or in the eaves. They want to be with us. Yeah. They want to commune with us. And we don't learn the lesson from the pigeon. Yeah. I, I, I was, this was um, during COVID, actually. Uh, I, my wife and I went to go and get some fish and chips for dinner and we walked. And it was a brutal, it was in the winter. It was so cold and rainy night. And there was this pigeon just huddled up. Like, and it, was, it seemed like it was shivering, you know. It was, I don't know if it was the wind, but it, I just felt the cold for this poor pigeon. And it was, and so I went back and I had the fish. So I ripped the fish and chips up and got some chips and put it in front of him and a little, there's eating on it. And, and I, I went back and I was just thinking about it during the night. I was like, oh, this, this poor pigeon out there in the cold tonight, but at least it's well fed tonight. And, Hot and, chippies. And, and in the morning I woke up and I was thinking the pigeon, I'm going to go check on the pigeon. I'm sure it's flown away, but I'm going to go check. I came back and it had died during the night and it was just laying there, this piece. And I thought, Oh. oh, and so I went and bought a box from the variety store and put it inside of the thing and I thought it deserves some dignity in death, right? So I put it in and some tissue paper, put it in the box and I put it in the bin, but, you know, I, I, I didn't have anywhere to bury it, but I just thought at least it had some kind of, you know... Some, variety some, box. Yeah. Bin. Yeah. Funeral. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's... um. But I re it's really, beautiful. it really got to me though. It's a beautiful I, story. I, but it really, it genuinely, like, yeah, I haven't told anyone that story before. So, you know, you're the, you're, you're the first now to behold this, uh, to take forward, and make of it what you will. But yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry for having a mocking look at the camera, but I am often drawn to birds with broken wings. I was in Hardware Lane in Melbourne, and uh, saw this pigeon and it was you know it was buggered mm. it was unable to fly I was sitting in a doorway similar thing and so there was a, a Chinese restaurant there and I said to the guy can I just <laughs> I'm sure he thought I said can I just help myself to the leftovers on the plate and he's like yeah okay mate if you want to mm, the moon man's not doing too well <laughs> so I was just I got all this rice yeah and other stuff and just started putting around. And inevitably, seagulls arrived mm. and... Ruins the party. Just, the party goes, the cops are called, 
listen, there's a pigeon having a party and then these seagulls arrive, Prick. like bikers, and they're stealing the rice and I'm kind of like trying to shoo them away. But this thing was like, he had, a, or he or she had a bit of a eat and then. That was that. I think, yeah, I think the end was inevitable. MSG got him. <laughs> Woke up in the middle of the night. Don't... <laughs> Oh, I wish that guy had have left a, a little cup of water. Yeah, my tongue oh is my tingling. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sweating under these feathers. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> that MSG. Oh. I love Chinese food. And my wife won't eat it because she just can't deal with the MSG. Yeah. It's a hives or something. Mm. And she goes, you know you're going to regret this. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> Give it to me. I love when it. You wake up in the middle of the night like a shivering <sighs> pigeon. Yeah, shivering, having a fever dream yeah. about you know some wrong fork you've taken in the road. Well, speaking of taking the wrong fork in the road, is what people have done in the uh, selection of film that you have for us today. Mm. A masterpiece in in every way. This film. None it other is than Chinatown. So uh, earlier I mentioned that Jack Nicholson is a massive hero of mine, but also uh, so is Faye Dunaway. And Faye mm. Dunaway in this movie is superb. I first saw her in Bonnie and Clyde and fell in love with, you know, the cheekbones and that presence and the mm. X factor. But then I've been a, a big fan onto Chinatown and then um, Network, uh, sorry, Network, um, yeah, network with um, with um, yeah, network. Uh, Peter Finch. Yes. Sorry. Let. Uh, so, can we do a little edit there? <laughs> sure. We don't even have it. This is all right. We can. Yeah. yeah okay. We, we, cool. We, we can. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to tidy shit up. <laughs> so yeah, it started with Bonnie and Clyde onto Chinatown, and mm. then Network, where she plays uh, like this. Uh, duplicitous, self-serving TV executive, mm. but such a modern woman, too. Ball breaker. And one of my favourite actors also in Network, and, and it was a close call between Chinatown and Network. Uh, you know, Finch got an, um, a, an Oscar after he died. Mm. Um, but William Holden is in that, too. One of my favourite actors, and oh. also a man that died through a drinking accident, he fell and hit his head and didn't realise that the injury was as bad as it right, was. Right. Continued drinking and then died of what they call desanguination, mm. which is bleeding to death from a head injury. So there's a bit of a tie in there. Yeah, yeah. But it was Chinatown that um, got my favourite movie. It's a tip, difficult thing to do because there's, you know, I've done a top five and a top ten many times. Mm. But uh, it's Jack Nicholson in this. He plays uh, a flawed private detective, Jake, Jake Eddis. Yeah. And um, he, he's kind of ham-fisted ways uh, drawn early when you see him in his office telling a joke. And it's a, it's a bit of a blue joke. Mm -hmm. It's poorly told. Mm -hmm. He thinks that he's great because he's telling the yeah, funniest reciting guy. Reciting this. And so you see a bit of a flaw in the glass already. You think, yeah. this guy's a bit of a dick. Yeah. And then... Um, Rather vain as well. Yeah. You know? And, and then he takes on this case and you see the integrity in the man as he digs mm. for the truth. And the truth is awful. It's, uh, yeah. It's a truly tragic, yeah. shocking, you, you, you know, story. But it's... So, but it's so, although it's fictionalised, it's so honest. Yeah, and so the, the horrible truth is hidden beneath uh, a wider narrative about California's water rights. And so he goes to a courtroom and he's following this thing and he goes up to the reservoir and Roman Polanski, uh, who directs Chinatown, mm. hey, plays, Kit yeah, yeah. plays a... Uh, you better keep your nose out of trouble. Yeah. And so he has a little cameo in it where um, Jay Geddes's nose Gets is cut open. Yeah. So he sticks the switchblade up his nose nostril. and cuts his nostril yeah. open. Mm. And 
so he works with this plaster Massive on his face. Wad of yeah, yeah and, and tape across. His, it's like it's so big and bulbous. This uh, yeah, and, and, wad, wad of. Uh, but you can bandage. imagine the pain of having a nostril cut open, mm. and so he's pushed on, and then there's you know, Dunaway playing this femme fatale with a secret to hide. Mm -hmm and a whole lot of pain. Mm, mm. And John Houston plays her father, and of course, at the time, Nicholson's going out with Angelica Houston, so he's kind of Jack's father-in-law, right. and also a famous director of his, in his own right. Mm. Um, another thing about this movie is that it's Bob Evans' Robert second. Evans! <laughs> Bob but, Evans. Did you ever read Kid Stays in the Picture? Ah, uh, yes. Did you ever listen to the audio of Kid Stays in the Picture, which is Bob Evans reading Reason. the book? No, I didn't know that, that Bob is, Evans reads the book. That is one of the most brilliant uh, listeners, just hearing his voice. and He's his got this wonderful accent. Yeah, yeah. So I love it, you, baby. The, the title, uh, The Kid Stays in the Picture, yes. is referring to Evans being in a picture and the um, director wanted him out, but the producer. Producer. Said, the kid stays in the picture. And, and anyone that wants to argue that, you got to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, and I love that American shit. That's the guy I want to be. Yeah. You know, that's when that turning point for Evans. And but, so but, Evans comes off the back yeah. of The Godfather. Yeah. His, uh, his second massive hit, because Rosemary's Baby yes. is his first. Working and with then, Polanski in that too. And then on to Chinatown. And have you seen um, the, the Paramount series? Yes, it's great. The, the Offer? The Offer. Yeah, The Offer. Yeah. So... They're talking about the storyline of Chinatown. He goes, so, Chinatown, hmm. Okay, so water rates with a bit of incest. <laughs> <laughs> talking about having a difficult job giving a 10-word pitch for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Chinatown, okay, what do we got? Um, that water Bloomfield, rates. Evans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the but Robert Town, like he, this the who wrote the screenplay for this. The screenplay is always referred to in all script writing books or anything re, re, relating to script writing as the template of the almost perfect screenplay. Right, like that. That's just all, and he won the Academy Award for that uh, for that screenplay. But and, uh, and but, look at Jack. Yeah, I mean he Jack. is. Uh, he went on Jack to. Uh, direct the two Jakes, which the two is, Jakes, the follow up, which, yeah, the the sequel to it, and yeah, mm. not a great sequel. And of course, when you talk about a, a script that is lauded as the template of all scripts, mm -hmm. very hard to do a sequel to that. Right, one. right. So Chinatown, yeah, yeah, it's a masterpiece. I, I would say it's a masterpiece on ever from the directing to the casting to the screenplay to to the lighting to the score, like. Everything in it is oh, yeah. is real, like you know, top notch. Um, if you haven't seen Chinatown, highly do yourself a favour. Highly recommend. God, I'm it. feeling a little bit no, look, David and Margaret here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. two thumbs up. Um, now, I would love to speak so much more about Chinatown. There's a lot more to talk about, but I want to get on to your your favourite book. Which kind right. of, which the perfect segue would have been from you talking about working at the shelter, bringing it around to the characters that would be in the book that you selected, that well, out at the bar, which is the Tender Bar, uh, written by J. R. Moringer. Um, J. R. Moringer's uh, celebrated and critically acclaimed um, memoir, mm. uh, the Tender Bar, is all about a bar in Manhasset um, on Long Island and uh, a place where he went as a kid and then he grew up as a young man into a man um, and all of the influences that were in the bar, originally called Dickens and then The Publicans. Mm. And it's an amazing book uh, given to me by one of my dearest friends, Sam Pang, who got onto Mo Ringer first of all through Open um, Andre Agassi's autobiography. Yeah, yeah so, he was a ghostwriter on that with him. Yeah, so yeah. Agassi read The Tender Bar mm. and then rang my ringer up and said, will you write my biography for me? And uh, so... Which, by the way, was a phenomenal read. I yeah, so a lot yeah. of... Uh, Sam's really into sport and okay. a close friend of him, 
his gave him open and he read open and then got onto the author mm. and went to Tender Bar, read it and thought, the person that really needs this book about, you know, an education in a bar and the characters that exist there mm. is Lawrence Mooney. And he gave me this and it is, it is a drinker's book because he celebrates drinking. And, you know, in the first page he says, we went there when we were happy, we went there when we were sad, we went there to find answers, we went there when we were searching for nothing. And it's all about all the people in a bar, all walks of life, mm. celebrating with one another, tearing each other apart. And it's a beautiful read. And there's, I, I read this, I was on my way to Croatia for my nephew's wedding. I thought I'm gonna travel with this book. Sam had given it to me in Adelaide at the Adelaide Fringe, Fringe Festival in 22. And so I'd started reading it then, distracted by the show, mm. put it down and thought, gonna take a plane flight, gonna be overseas. And so I started reading it and I'm one of those guys, annoyingly, that gets to a point in a book and it's like, you've got to listen to this. This is the most amazing passage. This is the mm. most amazing thing I've ever read. And so I was harassing my wife with it and we were by the pool in Doha. Uh, we'd flown and that's where we decided to have the break en route to the wedding. It was fantastic, it was like 44 degrees. They come around with frozen flannels that you put on your face and then, you know, water and after a while by the pool they say, you gotta go inside now, yeah. it's too hot for you. <laughs> You're not from round here, <laughs> are you mister? <laughs> so I was reading of this passage, can I read to you? Sure, please. So, um, JJ, the central character, who is J.R. Mo Ringer in the book, uh, his father has abandoned him. His mother is his best friend, but she, you know, um, suffers with bouts of depression and he's looking for a father figure and that's where the bar comes in. Mm. So he's always yeah. after, he's like, is that man my father? And he's got this thing called The Voice a chapter there because his father's on radio in New York. So he tries to, from Long Island, tune in just to hear the voice. And so these men that populate the bar, particularly his uncle and his friends, work as busboys, barmen, bouncers, and they take the kid to the beach one day. Um, and he is just in awe of them. He mm. wants to be a man, and like, when you're a boy, it's like you look at the men around you and it's like, I want muscles like that. I'm mm. gonna do my hair like that. Mm. Oh, he sticks his arm out the window when he drives. I'm gonna smoke as well. I'm gonna do all these things that men do. But he couldn't make an impression on them because he's just a kid, mm. he's just a little kid. So his uncle Charlie picks up the paper and uh, there's a puzzle in the paper called Wordy Gertie. And the men, they're sitting on the beach and they, they're not getting any clues. So the, uh, the answers to Wordy Gertie always rhyme. So Uncle Charlie said, let's see how smart you dopes are. Richard's ingredients is the clue. Bobo closed his eyes, Josie D, Jody D poked the sand with a stick, Colt rubbed his chin. Fucking puzzles, Bobo said. Life's confusing enough as it is. I said, Nixon's fixins. Silence fell over me like a shadow. I looked up from the sand and the men were staring, frozen. They couldn't have looked more surprised if Wilbur, the dog, had spoken. Even Wilbur looked surprised. The kid, Colt said. Holy shit, Bobo said. Give him another, Joey D said to the mouse in his pocket. Give him another, give him another. Uncle Charlie looked at me then back at the newspaper. He read, terrific Gary. I thought, super Cooper, I said. The men <laughs> threw their hands in the air and cheered. That was the day everything changed. I'd always thought there'd had to be a secret password into the men's circle. Words were the password. Language legitimised me in the men's eyes. After decoding the wordy gurdy, I was no longer the group mascot. The men didn't include me in every conversation, certainly, but they no longer treated me like a seagull that had wandered into their midst. I went from being a vague presence to a real person. Uncle Charlie no longer jumped a foot in the air every time he found me standing beside him. And the other men took more careful notice of me, talked to me taught me things. 
They taught me how to grip a curveball, how to swing a nine iron, how to throw a spiral, how to play seven card stud. They taught me how to shrug, how to frown, how to take it like a man. They taught me how to stand and promised me that a man's posture is his philosophy. They taught me to say the word fuck. Gave me this word as if it were a pocket knife or a good suit of clothes, something every boy should have. They showed me the many ways fuck could release anger, scare off enemies, rally allies, make people laugh in spite of themselves. They taught me to pronounce it forcefully, gutturally, even gracefully, to get my money's worth from the word. Why inquire me meekly what's going on, they said, when you can demand, what the fuck? They demonstrated the many verbal recipes in which fuck was the main ingredients. A burger at Gilgo, for instance, was twice as tasty when it was a Gilgo fucking burger. <laughs> Everything the men taught me that summer fell under the loose catchfall of confidence. Mm. They taught me the importance of confidence. That was all, but that was enough. That, I later realised, was everything. Mm. That's great. It's and like, so that is yeah. just a taste of the tender bar, but it's all about a boy growing up, and it's beautiful. It, it, just as you were reading that, I just it took me back to you know like the old tribesman uh, giving an initiation to a young person yeah. into adulthood or into manhood, and it feels you know that's what they were for him. And in Western culture, we don't have you know formalised right. rites of passage, right. and so we have to fashion our own. Mm -hmm. And I used to do a bit about you know one of the rites of passage as as a young man, or rites of passage, was getting drunk and coming home and smashing a letterbox. When you smash your first letterbox, it's like <laughs> I've seen it done. People have done it to ours. Now I know how good it feels yeah. to <laughs> smash somebody's letterbox, <laughs> and now. I am a man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you're a good man, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to see you in such a good place too. Thank Just you. Keep on fighting the good fight, my friend. You know, um, you can only get to good places with good people as, you know, your avatars, as your wayfarers, mm. and you have been a lot for me. Oh. You've let me shop, you've given me books, and you've always had a lot of faith in my ability so and we've always had fun dinners together yeah right, let's dine again soon we shall thank you Lawrence